to our third week of lectures and our second online lecture discussion. And I have with me on the panel tonight, we've got Ben, Catherine, and Christy. And of course, there's still plenty of room for others who would like to join us. If you haven't received an invite and clicked on the invite, if you could email me your Google Plus enabled Gmail account, and then I will send you an invite to join our panel. If, however, you're not on the on the panel, but you're watching live on the video stream, then if you could please post your questions into the um, the box just below the video, where you see you should see a big white box that has post a question in the top left hand corner, and there you can put your questions, and we will attempt to answer them. Now tonight we're going to be exploring the first in our really um, conceptual topics in the course, where we're going to talk about design thinking. And this is where we're going to explore how we actually go about teaching, in particular the design and technology part of digital techno of, of design and sorry of the technologies learning area. And next week we'll look at um, now I've forgotten it. Who remembers what we're going to do next week? Computational, computational? thinking. <laughs> Correct. Yes, computational thinking, where we'll explore the digital technologies half of the technologies learning area. So. If you could also, if you're watching on the video stream, please just put a message into that box um, so that we know that you're out there. Just say your name and that you're there. Um, so keep a sort of a role by doing that sort of process. So if you want recognition for being up on a Friday evening watching a YouTube video stream of this lecture, put your comments on there. So to the panel, start off with any general questions or comments about the readings for this week. Any thoughts? So it's a lot to take in in a short amount of time. Yep. Yeah. I, I actually found it quite easily to relate to being from an IT background. Most of this is fairly common to me. And the problems that, uh, like I described, are things that I've had to deal with for the last 10 years, explaining to mm -hmm. layman's how to understand how complex systems work and how when one part fails, it affects the other parts of a, of a whole and that sort of thing. So I thought this week was actually much better than the last two readings. <laughs> yes, yeah, so a lot of this material does come from a computing um, area. It emerged first from businesses, but then computing took up a lot of the concepts and then developed them because they were faced with a lot of these sort of practical problems all the time in coming up with solutions um, where there hadn't really been processes in place before to actually solve. Christy, did you have any thoughts about the readings this week? I have to be totally honest with you because I'm an honest person. I haven't <laughs> even started these readings because I just, I, I, I just haven't. And I would be, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I will have them done by Monday, Tuesday, but I just, I just haven't had the chance. I'm trying to get through so I can get onto quiz two. You know, trying to get that information into me before I even start that. I, I get a little bit scared of the quizzes, and you know why I'm scared of the quizzes because of the quizzes. This is the only thing that actually is valued in points. I understand. Anyone else agree? Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What's this other lady's name? Let's move on. <laughs> Sorry? Pardon? What's the other lady's name? Uh, I'm Catherine. Catherine. Hi, if Catherine. You have mouth... you done the readings? I have, yep, yep. Okay. It was like <laughs> and they're like the best. The best part was when I was scrolling down, I saw Adam Savage from MythBusters, and that was yeah. Really cool. Did you watch the video? Yeah, it was really good, and the whole hackerspace thing too. I was involved in that when Were I was you? younger. Because that was you based know. in Brisbane, wasn't it? Well, they had yeah. it in in Brisbane. I, I mean, we that. did all that sort of stuff, like deconstructing things and building open source projects. You know. And like the things that, that that I work on in my everyday job is the same sort of stuff. It's all open source projects that we remodel to do uh, things that we need them to do and stuff like that. So. Perfect. Okay, well, we might start at the beginning then and look at systems thinking. So the idea of systems thinking is to provide our students with a new way of of, of viewing the world. Because remember, the whole point of um, both design and technology and digital technologies is to give students a whole different perspective on how to approach 
situations and problems and opportunities that they face in their everyday engagement with um, what happens at school, but also what happens at home, and eventually what happens in their workplace and in their home life. So who would like to try to give a stab at what system thinking involves? Isn't it when you take a situation or a problem and you, you break it down into smaller chunks to make it a bit more manageable? That's certainly part of it. And we give that a particular word um, called, I, I gave you a few words for it in this case, but analysis is the overarching term. And then we've okay. got deconstruction and, and, decompose. um, and decomposing. Yeah, yeah. Decomposing is a new term and it causes a few strange looks when teachers first hear that word. Um, yeah. It's not normally a word we use of students, but it's in the new curriculum document, so we've used it here. <laughs> mm. So, so Ben, you've had some experience. So, so go on, yeah. Ben. So it's just basically looking at how, so taking a, a whole system and then breaking it down into the individual components and then the systems inside those components and how everything interrelates and works as part of a whole. Yeah. Yes. And like also the bike how... Example. Yes. But it's also how systems that we might be looking at can be embedded within larger systems. And sometimes we ignore those, but the problem that might be involved might be related to those, ex those other systems that impact upon the particular system we might be focused on. Um, so understanding that interconnectedness of everything is a very important part of systems thinking. And the, the fact that if we create something that has a, a particular system in it, it may also have impacts upon lots of other systems, such as the environment, such on different people's uses of it. Um, if it's an electronic thing, it might interfere um, with radio waves, with other electronic devices, and a whole lot of other potential consequences that we may not have thought about when we were simply focused on the actual um, thing that we're talking about in particular. OK, so does anyone have any questions about systems thinking that they'd like illuminated in more detail? Remember, anyone online can also post questions into the um, discussion group, and we'll see those and incorporate those into our discussions. Now, I had a, just a just a thought. Just by its definition, does systems thinking not make simple problems overly complex by having to break them down into individual components? I know that it encourages innovative thinking and creativity and all that sort of thing, but can it not? overcomplicate things as well? That is a criticism of systems thinking and some of the design methodologies that have sort of been developed from that. Um, probably the biggest criticism has been that it creates, it becomes too formulaic. And a lot of particularly mm -hmm. creative designers who are approaching things from the creative sort of area find those systemic or systematic approaches to doing creativity um, inhibiting. Um, and so you are correct sometimes when we do that, but when we're working with young children in particular, where they don't really have any strategies for approaching problem solving, um, then giving them these frameworks that they can actually work through can be very beneficial. But you're perfectly correct, for those in the design industries and so forth, they often ignore these sort of approaches, um, mostly because they've, they've learnt them, but then they've moved on from needing to rely upon them, and they're using much more... Um, I won't say so much creative, but other approaches that incorporate a whole range of strategies rather than just relying on one particular strategy. But mm. generally, most problem solving we would find is involving some analysis and, um, and then breaking it down into smaller bits in order to understand how those smaller parts may contribute to the whole. But yeah. you're right in that I think the example was um, one of the examples was of water. We're breaking water down into its individual elements of hydrogen and um, oxygen. We could study hydrogen and oxygen all we want, but we'd never get an understanding by just looking at those two small parts about what water is actually um, like. It's only when they're, they're, re they're recombined that we can then see how they work as a system as a whole. Um, and that's part of actually one of the um, criticisms of us looking at the world, in that we tend to look at the world in a whole lot of individual systems without looking at how all these systems actually work within a much larger system, um, sometimes referred to as a Gaia system, about how the whole world works together as one massive system, of which we're only one small part, and that we have various aspects that interrelate with that. Um, 
So there's a whole lot of research and discussion around how our perspectives on systems can view very much determine how we view problems and view the world. Okay, so still waiting for a few questions from online. We've got a couple of people introducing themselves, which is great. I see so if, um, Kieran, Beverly, Alexandra, and Christy, and a couple of others there, I think. Sorry, go on. So for us as teachers, um, when it comes to this, these topics of the, the design thinking and, and the technologies and everything, mm -hmm. one of the things that we're doing is to teach them to become like a systems thinker. You know Absolutely. how you have like a critical thinker? Yeah, I've just never thought of being a systems thinker before. It's a completely yes. foreign concept, but it's very interesting. And we combine all those under the heading um, design thinking. So exactly. there's a number of different yeah. sort of sub aspects of thinking. Um, that we look at. So let's probably go on to the next aspect which is design thinking um, or solution based thinking and this is where we get students to be viewing the world as and problems that they face from the perspective of the solution. So what's the actual solution they want to get to and want to see achieved. Now that may be a certain um, food that they want to be able to create or it might be a, a birdhouse that keeps a bird protected from a cat. Um, or a whole range of different problems that they might want to engage with. But while in science we have the scientific method that goes through a particular way of viewing things, and in history we've got a particular um, way of viewing the world in terms of historical um, development, in systems or solutions based thinking or design thinking, we get the students to think about the solution they want to achieve, and then we work through an engineering process of how that can be achieved. So, so working very different to science. Yes. So you start with what you want to achieve and then you work back to how, to how best to achieve that. Now there's a few caveats on that. Sometimes that can inhibit creativity if you just think of um, a product that you want to produce rather than thinking of it as a solution that you want to achieve. And that's one of the difficult aspects of getting across to students is that in design thinking and in um, design challenges what we're doing is we're solving problems. We're not producing products or solutions in that respect. Um, so it's very important to actually get them to that level. If they're simply producing a product, then really that's more craft-based work, where they're just following through a series of steps to make something um, without actually having a purpose for that or for any sort of aspect of design or creativity that they're putting into the um, product that they're creating. So are you saying a product to solve a solution? Uh, to solve a problem. Um, solve it a will problem, be a solution I mean, yeah. to a problem. Yeah. yeah. So for example, the um, problem is that the, the shops are really far away, so you would design a car to get to the shops easier. Yes, that would be one potential solution. But as we go through design challenges, the idea is for them to creativity, creatively um, come up with a whole range of other possible solutions to that and then choose from which is the most effective solution to achieve their aim that they want to achieve. Um, and that's where system thinking comes back in because they may start thinking, okay, yes, how to get to the shop may be a solution, but maybe bringing the shop closer to them, making a mobile shop or having a branch shop built on their, on their school or some other approach. Um, by looking at the whole system as a whole, they can then see other alternatives to that uh, problem. So to be fair to say that you, the, the most optimum way of designing would be to use both methods of thinking. Uh, which two are you referring to? Uh, are you thinking talking about computational? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. so is is systems problem. thinking system thinking a part of design thinking? Actually, the other way around. Design thinking would be part of Design systems thinking. Design thinking is part of systems. Yeah. System okay. thinking would be a, a, a meta-level perspective, um, and one way of systems thinking would be the design thinking process. Um, it's sort of what we use just in terms of introducing that. Probably let's look at the design thinking process, which goes through a number of steps. The first of which is to identify or define a problem, identify the problem that you want to actually solve, then researching that problem. Of course, remember, we don't want students just going with the first obvious solution. Um, a large part of design thinking is for students to be 
coming up with creative, innovative new ways of solving a problem rather than just going for the immediate solution. So getting to the shops, some creative ways might be um, making a trampoline so you can bounce over a wall to get to the shop quicker or a, um, a flying fox to get there or a tunnel or a balloon. There could be a whole range of creative, innovative ways of moving from one location to another location other than Someone just say, improving a, a vehicle. Teleporter. A teleporter I was going to say quantum teleportation, but I didn't want to sound like a nerd. <laughs> you look like one. No, I don't. I look it's like a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so going through the design thinking process, we've got defining the problem, um, researching that problem to explore what might be involved in solutions, solving it, then a thing called ideating, which is um, one of the techniques for ideating is brainstorming. There's a whole range of other things, but it, really it's coming up with all the possible um, solutions that there may be for that particular problem. And then you go through a process of um, working out which of those you want to actually try to put into place. And in this particular um, series of steps, there's prototyping, where you come up with a small scale solution just to test whether or not it's viable. And you might do that for a couple of potential solutions to help you decide between which of those solutions is the one you want to take forward. Then you choose the one that you want to commit to. You actually produce it, create the solution, create the product or whatever's involved with the solution, and then reflect upon that um, normally through a process of testing the solution and evaluating it, and in this particular sequence, learning from that. Um, of course, ideally, you would then go back through that cycle where you'd let the students take what they learnt and then come up with, well, they'd go back and look at the problem again from their new perspective on having tried a particular solution. They may need to do a bit more research then come up with some new solutions or adapt the solution that they'd already thought of, try out a new um, solution to that problem, and then see if that solution is better than the one they just tried that may not have been as effective. So it rarely happens in our schools where we actually give students a chance to go through that cycle more than once. Um, mm. But there's a huge amount of benefit that can be gained from that. So you can imagine what's same for you guys when you did the first quiz. That was your first go through that quiz. Having gone through that once, going through it again is a much, you have a whole different perspective on what the quiz would involve. Very similar to how we do drafting in, in our writing process. The first time you write something, it's often fairly poor, but by going through that process of writing it, you can then see how it can be improved upon and going through it again can produce a better result. I, I can Any relate comments? to that with, with the kites. <laughs> Absolutely, good example. Like the first kite that I built, looked wicked and on the on the floor and it was really big and it had a huge tail and I took it outside and it just tore straight away because it was so big and the wind just ripped through it. So then I knew for the next one I need to make it heavier and then make further alterations until finally I got to the fourth one and it actually worked. Absolutely. And one of the things I actually try to encourage and <coughs> and talk about in design um, design challenges is the importance of failure. You actually want to design your design challenges so that all students will fail initially when they try to do a design challenge. If it's too easy for them, then it's really a trivial process. They already knew how to actually solve that problem and, and create the solution. Mm. And obviously, if it's too hard, if they can never get to it, that's a problem. But ideally, they'll try two or three attempts until they actually get a solution that works. And then they have a great sense of achievement and accomplishment at having done that and learnt a lot more about the design process of course, the old adage of learning from your mistakes is very true in that you'll understand a lot more about the problem and about how it's been put in, you've put a solution into place by looking at what went wrong than if you simply did something and it all worked perfectly and that, then you just moved on from that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we might move on. Um, there's a number of attributes of design thinking. Uh, the first is we like to give students what are called wicked problems. Um, Anyone want to have a go or give an example of a wicked problem? Remembering anyone out there online can also provide contributions. Well, they're tricky. <laughs> well, yes, they can be tricky. So could a, a wicked problem be like something of a really big scale like uh, lack of san clean sanitation in Africa? Yes, you're right. Generally, they are of a larger scale. Most, of course, they're more complex in that case. 
Um, a non-wicked problem would be something like making a kite. It's something fairly easy to understand. It's well defined. You know that you've got to actually make it so it flies and so forth. Um, there's probably going to be a few steps. You might make a few mistakes and it might not work a few times, but you, you're pretty sure you'll get there fairly quickly and you know the process that'll get there. But a problem of trying to solve poverty or um, improving sanitation in a, in a location involves a whole lot more complexity that you're not sure about how you're going to solve that when you first approach the problem. And you're going to have to do a whole lot of research and prototyping and trying things out before you've got enough understanding to be able to make a, any real inroads into that problem. Um, and that's what makes it a wicked problem. Now we normally don't give these sort of problems to the very early year students, but in towards upper primary and certainly into secondary, they should be starting to engage with these sort of problems that don't have a clearly understood solution from the, from the outset. Well that leads into the next bit which is the aha moment, where students get to a point where they suddenly understand what solution might there be to that problem. And unless it's a wicked problem, they don't really have an opportunity to get to the aha moment because they've already got a preconception of what the solution would be. They've seen plenty of other solutions to that problem before. They know that they'll just have to choose from one of those and put it into place and that'll be a, an acceptable solution. But if they're challenged with something that they don't know how to solve and they've got to do that research, they've got to try out a whole lot of different approaches and really think about how to actually go about coming up with a solution to the problem, then you give them the opportunity to really come up with something new and innovative for themselves. It may have been done by lots of other people before but it'll be something um, rather special for them when they come up with a solution to the problem. Does having things like Google around make coming up with these sorts of challenges difficult? Um, it can and it can't. Um, one aspect is the research does become easier and that they can find lots of um, solutions that other people have put in place. But generally, students, particularly uh, in the primary years, will want to come up with their own solutions to a problem. Um, if they find something that already exists, they may use that as scaffolding, but they normally try to still come up with something new. Um, and that's one of the good things with young kids. Normally in the upper years, in upper senior years in high school, they'll often fall back on something that they know will work. But the younger the students, the more um, likely that they'll be willing to experiment and um, risk failure to try new ideas out, because they're used to doing that all the time, because um, many things are new for them at that age. Okay, we probably need to get keep moving a bit. Um, so next we go into some areas of methods and processes, so different ways of going about this. And the first one I present to you is one done through Stanford University's D School, um, who sort of, they're doing a lot of great research around design thinking, and they've come up with a model that it keeps changing every year as they refine it, but they actually give all their students in that course um, design challenges, that, or um, design thinking challenges as they put them, for them to solve. And I think I gave a video in there of where they had to come up with a coffee cup to, to go on a bicycle to, or to transport coffee while they're riding their bikes. And it was a complex problem. They didn't have a clear understanding of the solution at the start. They had to prototype it, try to come up with various solutions, and they had to test it out with different people and product tested, and they went through a whole creative process of coming up with that solution. Um, so the design thinking model that's presented there is quite involved, involves lots of steps, and involves working closely with a client. Um, so you've got to see things in terms of the product uh, or the solution meeting the needs for someone else. Uh, for our students in schools, we often give them more simplified design challenges, which often the solution is for themselves or for their classmates. Um, we do, don't normally give them a chance to work with real clients until the upper primary and into the secondary schools, but it can be a great way for them to think through problems and to be more creative in their solutions because the, the client will give them a whole lot of constraints and requirements that they may not have thought about themselves and often then that will lead to a more creative response than just coming up with what they could think of themselves. Any ideas on that? Most awesome. of our comments online seem to be around our pirate. No! <laughs> I don't think there's a lot of people watching. No, there's about five or six I can see, but yes, not very many. Hopefully we're going to get more watching it um, during the week. Generally from the statistics we're getting about 150 students watching the videos, so probably about 95% of the course so far have been watching them, which is a good thing. Cool. 
Um, Samantha gives a, an example of the egg one. Is the egg one a wicked problem? No, Samantha, the egg one probably wouldn't be a wicked problem because it's, it's still very easy to see. It's easy for us to conceive of po possible solutions to that problem straight from the start. Um, padding it, uh, doing various things to protect the egg. If, uh, if, for example, we had to work out how to make sure, well, a problem might be that some of the eggs weren't being fertilized um, from a chicken coop. And so we had no real idea of what was going on and we had to do a whole lot of investigation and testing and exploration. Um, and it may be that the eggs are falling too far down a particular tube after they're being laid uh, and that's causing um, the problem. But there could be a whole range of other issues to do with um, eggs in a particular um, problem. So that would then make it a wicked problem. But simply dropping an egg and making sure it doesn't crack would be a much more simplified problem. Now there is the opportunity to do a full um, B-School design thinking um, problem for one of your level four, I think it is, um, challenges. So if you really want to come up with your own solution to a problem that you want to investigate and explore, then you can through th this module. Um, most of the other ones you'll see that are contextualized for the year levels. You've been given particular problems to be solved and then you'll go through a design challenge process to solve those and show the process you went through. Um, but a more, more simplified process than the D-School um, design thinking process. But if you want to really undertake a complex problem um, that you really want to sort of explore and develop all the way through, often to a commercial product or something that could actually be used by others, then you've got the opportunity to do a level four task around that. So Where next. Is that? Okay, is that the stage that was, of thinking? Um, no, no, well before that, just after we talked about at, uh, wicked problems. The there seven was, um, stages. Yes, the seven stages of the universal travel model of the creative process. Creative process. Well, actually, no, sorry, yeah. no, it's the, it's the next step just on from that. It's the Stanford, the Stanford. School Design Process. They Empathize. have five stages, which is empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. But what do we mean by empathize? What do we, I mean, I know what that means, but what are, what are you talking about in, okay. in this? Well, a lot of design. problems that we have in the world involve people. And so understanding why it's a problem for people, why it's actually a problem oh, okay. for a person yeah. or for a situation, and understanding the problem in great detail from the perspective of often a client or other, other people. So when you're given a problem, it's quite easy. Um, so we don't normally have that step. But when you've actually got to go and talk to people and work out what the actual problem is, from their perspective, um, and it might be from several people's perspective until you work out what the actual real problem is in a particular situation. Um, that's where empathizing has been brought into this um, equation. Okay. Okay, um, and there's a number of documents there that you'd need to explore and go into detail to follow through the Stanford design thinking process in the, um, into its entirety. On from that, I just do, I give a brief summary of analysis, evaluation, and synthesis as being the fundamental core aspects of all problem solving. Um, analyzing, where we try to work out the why and what of a project. Synthesizing, where we bring things back together to create the solution. And evaluation, where we test and um, see whether or not the actual solution has actually really achieved what we set out to solve. Um, particularly with young kids, that can be a problem, whereby they get into the uh, design process or the production process very quickly and they create a solution that doesn't really have any relationship to the actual problem that they were set to solve. Um, but they just wanted to be creative or explore the new tools or um, they were just having fun with making something. They weren't really thinking about it solving a problem. Okay, so any, oh, we'll, we'll skip ahead and we'll keep moving on to futures thinking. Um, just checking if you've got any questions. Uh, still, most people talking about our pirate. <laughs> On you, Ben. I thought it had the other people. people to watch. It is, and uh, and we're getting a lot of comments about it, which is a good thing. Uh, although, remember, people, you can also ask questions about what we're discussing and make your comments about uh, the actual content of the of the topics. Okay, futures thinking. This is another um, way we try to get try to encourage students to view the world, and this is by considering how the world will be different in the future, and how they what they might be creating 
might have impact upon future users or future people that have to live in our world. Um, I give the example of the invention of dynamite. Um, when that was first invented, it was done by a chemist who wanted to help out with the mining industry to make it safer for miners to be able to more quickly mine, and so there were there'd be fewer deaths involved in mining. But that was just that was invented just before the eve of World War One, and then it was used extensively during World War One. And the inventor was so remorseful about it all that he established what was now known as the Nobel Prize or the Nobel Peace Prizes. Um, because he was so horrified that his invention, that he had so hope, hope, had such hope that it would actually make the world a better place, was actually then used in such a tragic way. And so, we want to get our students thinking about the potential consequences of the solutions that they create. Um, and those consequences can be along two dimensions. One is in terms of time, about how future generations may have to cope with the consequences of their solutions. But also in, in space as well, where it may not have any consequences for them personally, but it might have, may have consequences on their classmates, or on their family, or the local community, or even internationally and elsewhere. So thinking about the actual, um, what they produce in terms of its sustainability and potential consequences is a significant aspect of futures thinking. But also simply just in encouraging them to be more exploratory and creative in their solutions. So not just thinking about um, what's been done in the past or what we can currently do, but trying to imagine, okay, we want to take things further. What might it be possible for us to achieve? We may not quite have the technology now, but we might. And by futures thinking, students will be encouraged to actually think, think forward and come up with the latest new innovations. So thinking, okay, we may not have an iPad at the moment, but what if we did make a, a mobile phone with a larger screen? What would that be like? What, what could we do on that that could be more engaging than trying to move things around on a very small screen. And of course, we now have the iPads, but getting students to try to imagine what could be the latest products coming up can be a lot of fun and um, very engaging. Now, we used to do it a lot around cities, imagining what future cities would be like and how buildings would be different and how we'd have transportation systems differently, how we'd move people around. But you can also do fun futures thinking things around what foods might be available in the future what sort of new combinations or tastes or different types of foods might we be inventing soon, or what different forms of clothing might be invented, um, what new products are available that could be turned into clothing or different ways of incorporating, a very popular thing at the moment is incorporating um, electronic devices and computers into our clothing. And you can actually buy little kits where students can sew them into clothing so that they can turn their clothes into uh, musical instruments or detect temperature and um, change things based on temperature, or a whole lot of other range of different innovative sort of approaches. Okay, so any questions or comments about futures thinking? Uh, I think no. I just think it's a good idea. I really think that this part of this this module is a really good idea. Hmm. For I, I all think the reasons it's, that you said. But coming up with the creative ideas and innovative ideas is not as easy as everyone seems to think here. <laughs> like coming I'm up not, with the I'm iPad, not thinking that, that anything, would be like Pete, oh, believe me. me. And would it like sort even, of, um, sorry. So I was just going to say even the assumption, well, just to come up with the idea of, yeah, cool, I got a mobile phone, what, did this, what, what would this be like with a bigger screen? Like, how does someone just think of that? That's what, if, I, if I knew the answer to that, I'd be rich. <laughs> You and would, it would, and we, I'm sure, no, but it's getting people thinking, isn't it? I think it will get them to, like students, get them a bit more accountable for actions as well when they start thinking about what they're doing now and what will happen in the future as a result. Yes, yeah. so sort of the accountability yeah. aspect and yeah. the sustainability aspect, but don't discount the fact that your students will be the ones that come up with these things in the future. They will be oh, the inventors yeah. and creators. Um, and towards the end, we're going to look at creativity and some of the ways we can actually foster creativity in our students. But I know plenty of students around Brisbane that are now multimillionaires, where they created their inventions in year nine and ten, and took them through into products. Um, we had one that we normally bring here on the Gold, onto, onto campus who lives on the Gold Coast, who invented the new form of skateboard, a uh, yeah, skateboard where you can um, articulate in different directions. Um, oh, wow. Had another group of students up in Brisbane who created the websites for Toyota and they did that in year 10. Um, so there's lots of opportunities for our students to be innovative and creative 
and take those through into um, future opportunities. Now, of course, not every student will do that, but we want to make sure every student has the opportunity to do that and has the capacity to do that and be supported in their education if they want to choose that pathway to go into that creative design process. Mm. Okay, so the last bit of futures thinking was around um, some examples of futurists who spend their time actually trying to think up potential things in the future. And we did have a question from Cara as to whether or not these sorts of thinking would be part of the Australian curriculum. And yes, you will find all of these things embedded in the design and technology section of the um, technologies learning area. Um, and yes, part of it will be that we do need to make sure that students are developing these capabilities through the Australian curriculum. Good okay, question, let's move Cara. on then. Let's move on then to an example of the maker movement. Um, so this is where a whole lot of spaces are being set aside to allow students that do want to be creative and exploratory in this way have got the tools and encouragement to do so. And a lot of libraries are now repurposing themselves to be spaces whereby students can actually be creative and be designers. Um, a lot of libraries have now put in computer lab, basic lots of computers so that students can actually do stuff in that respect. But more and more they're actually making space where students can actually make things and be much more creative in that respect. Even public libraries are looking at um, repurposing themselves to provide space for this sort of thing to happen. Our state library in Brisbane has created a whole um, space where this can occur, um, mostly around digital technologies at the moment, but they're looking at doing it for um, the more arts and craft based activities as well. But as I mentioned in the, in the documents, there's a number of groups in Brisbane and the Gold Coast and around the world which are set up to allow this form of um, invention and creativeness and craft um, craft making to be occurring. Now lots of schools are looking at setting these things up um, to enable this to occur during lunch times or as after school activities. In the United States it's a very big thing as part of their um, holiday camp programs whereby students can come along and do various camp programs. In our private schools in Queensland, we have a thing called Days of Excellence, whereby students go off to all, sort, all different schools that are hosting various activities. I used to host ones on robotics and space sciences, whereby I'd, I'd get students from about 20, 30 different schools to come to my school, and we'd have a whole day where we just explored um, various technologies, and um, we, did a, we did missions to Mars, and we created Mars rovers and all that sort of stuff around a particular theme. But there were students going off and doing ones around cooking or um, other different arts and crafts activities, a whole range of just different creative and artistic endeavors. Any comments on the maker spaces and or maker movement and hacker spaces and things of that nature? When I first read it, I was under the impression that it was like an, a virtual space, but it's 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 like everyone sitting in the actual physical same room and working on similar things. Is that right? Yes, they do tend to be. Even the ones that are based on computers do tend to gather people together. There's a whole range of ones called um, hackathons where um, 20 or 30 people, sometimes much larger, get together and they might um, spend the whole weekend just writing computer games, um, supporting each other, encouraging each other, sharing ideas, and just focusing on that. And there's a whole range of other sort of... Google sponsors a number of these and a whole lot of other large corporations also do them. There's a, there's a group in Brisbane again doing hackathons around um, computer programming uh, towards making uh, new computer games. So normally it does involve ones. a community. Sorry? There are virtual hackerspaces as well. There are, but they tend to be more defined as communities of practice rather than um, hacking events. Uh, but you're right, sometimes they do occur virtually. Uh, but that normally only occurs with the um, computer programming based ones. Most of the other type activities involve some sort of creation of an object and, and showcasing that, yeah, hands-on activities. Yep. Okay, well, we might move on and get into project-based learning. So probably you've all heard about project-based learning in your other curriculum areas a little bit. But yep. In design and technology in particular, we do a lot of project-based learning. In fact, almost everything is done through projects um, and setting up activities for students to work through to achieve a particular outcome. And in particular, we have 
a particular type of project called design challenges or particular methodology. And in most of our schools we do a four stage project or sometimes it's a three stage project in the younger years where they investigate a problem, define it, do some research, work out some potential solutions. Uh, sorry, then they go into ideation where they come up with lots of different potential solutions and then they create the product or make it or manage the process or whatever and then they test it and evaluate it. One thing I encourage is to think of problems or design challenges in this respect that if there's no way of evaluating it, no way of testing it, then really it's more likely to be an artistic work or a craft work. So one big problem is often we want to make up a, a model of something. So say a model of a spaceship or a model of a, of a park. And that's really, really hard to test to see whether or not it's actually solved a problem. It may be a great representation and could be used in lots of different ways, but say creating a model of a volcano, unless it actually erupts and you can then test the effectiveness of the model in terms of that process to be effective in erupting, it's really just an artistic work and that falls more within the arts curriculum area. Um, so be careful with your design challenges. Most of them are fairly well set up so that you won't make this mistake, but um, I used to often let students come up with their own challenges and sometimes they would come up with really fantastic solutions that were just um, impossible to test effectively. Um, and that can be really problematic because that's part of the stages that you need to go through to do a full design challenge process. Um, so for younger years we often simplify that to down to just what's called make, so design, make, appraise or um, design, make, evaluate. Um, there's various words we use but they generally involve those three steps. Coming up with a potential solution, coming up with the ideas for it, making it and then testing and evaluating it. Okay, we've got a couple of questions. Um, just trying to think, see if there's any actual questions in the comments. No. Okay. So, any any questions from the guys in the panel about design challenges? Uh, no. As an assessment item, I thought they were awesome. Yep. So we're going to, you're going to, generally you'll be using them in your assessment, but the, probably the key thing is to remember that it's the process that's far more important than the actual product or solution that they've created. Yeah. Um, and that will be the same for when you do your design challenges. It'll be very much going through those steps, um, coming up, defining the problem, making sure you've got a very clearly defined problem that you want to solve, investigating that as a problem, coming up with lots and lots of potential solutions, so not just the one you eventually um, use, then actually coming, um, actually developing that solution, and yes, you will actually have to make something or come up with a solution for something, so it's not just a, a theoretical process, all of our design challenges are practical tasks, um, and then actually coming up with a way of testing that solution and evaluating its effectiveness, whether or not it actually solved the problem that you initially wanted to um, solve. Yeah. A couple yeah, of theories no, we put in. Sorry, Go I was on. just going to say, like, as an assessment task, I, I had never done anything like that in my own schooling, and I thought that that was. Uh, I feel that I probably learnt more doing an assessment task like that than if I was just to write a paper on the actual process as well, because it was hands on and I got to follow through with the processes and experiment with things and test, and I thought that would be valuable for really valuable for kids as well. And my kids enjoyed doing it. I made them go build their own kites and see if they could get them to fly and and they stuffed up as well. But <laughs> Good to see. <laughs> value yeah, is very I, important. It had a lot of value. Yes, no, and normally the kids really love design challenges because they, they love doing something practical and being creative and coming up with different solutions. Um, sometimes they'll want to jump straight in and start working on the very first thing that they think of and that's you sometimes have to hold them back a little bit from that. Um, normally, what we what I often used to do was give them a little mini challenge to start with, so that they can just have a bit of fun trying out something and just making something, and then getting them to go into the actual process in more detail. Um, so, say with kite making, we might make them they might create paper planes first and work out how paper planes work without going through the full design process. But then we start investigating why things fly. Um, the challenge might be to actually have suspend something of one kilogram um, 
20 meters up in the sky. Mm. And then really good design challenges allow them to have multiple options from that. So one option would be to make a really effective kite that could lift up that amount of weight and sustain it up there. But other students might decide to create a balloon type um, construction. Um, someone else might want to do a remote control plane that would suspend something up there. Um, others might do rocketry. Or there could be a whole range of potential solutions to a problem. And that's where good design challenges allow that creativity. It also allows students with different levels of ability to match um, their solutions to what they can um, achieve. And so a student that wasn't very comfortable with trying uh, something that's quite complex might simply make a, a kite or a balloon. But another student might be really um, thinking outside the box and might try to do a catapult that would launch something up that far into the air and so go be, and challenge themselves much more. And as teachers, a lot of your job will be actually pushing students just beyond their comfort zone to challenge themselves beyond what they currently know they can achieve. And that's what we call Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. Setting challenges that are just beyond what students can currently do, but not so far that they can't achieve it. And that's where learning occurs. If you set them a challenge that they already know how to achieve, then no learning can occur, because they already know how to do that. The learning is already there. Sometimes you can do it for a bit of reinforcement, but no really effective learning will occur at that point. So setting that challenge just right, particularly when you've got a large, diverse range of students, can be difficult. But good design challenges normally allow that. Even simple ones, such as an egg drop. For, for students that want more of a complex challenge, you might give them different levels of material or different heights that it's got to go from. Um, for students that are, that are challenged just putting some basic material around an egg, then you could make a much more simplified task for them. Give them lots of foam and um, make them go through that process where they can achieve a solution. Still learning a lot, because it's beyond what they could originally um, do, but nowhere near the level of challenge that you may be setting things for your more advanced students. And then there's the well, the, the, sorry. Is it fair sorry, to say parameters of design challenges can be fairly open as well to allow movement inside those challenges? They can be, um, although there's a few things you need to be careful on that. Generally, the more parameters you impose, the more creativity that in, enables. Um, very open challenges normally just have one or two solutions that everyone goes for. But when there's a lot of constraints, such as very limited materials or um, particular other things that it's got to do, like travel 10 meters, instead of just saying make, making a transport device, which has no real parameters, making a device that will move one kilogram of weight 20 meters across rough terrain makes the task much more challenging and, um, and get many more creative solutions. So just before we move on there, I wanted to mention the concept of flow. And that's where if you get things just right, where something's sufficiently challenging to be really engaging for a student, but not so challenging that it causes stress and they disengage because they don't feel that they can make a successful solution, you can get into a state called flow. And that's when you lose sense of time and you're just so engrossed with a, with a task that um, learning is really, really effective in, the, in that time space. And we often see it when people are playing complex computer games, but also when people are involved in music or in other um, activities where they just get so involved in the activity that they enter what's known as a state of flow. Um, we probably need to move on a little bit quicker because we're just about out of time. Uh, design briefs are generally the, the, the description of the task that we give to students. So the challenge that has to be overcome and the constraints around that challenge and often some aspects of, of what we need them to test and evaluate their solutions towards. Competitions can be great ways of um, encouraging students to get involved in design challenges, particularly into school and in, even international competitions where students are actually developing up quite complex challenges. And I've given you a couple of examples there of the egg drop, um, making um, furniture out of cardboard is a very popular one. And then the F1 challenge is very popular here on the Gold Coast, particularly when we had the uh, racing occurring down in Service Paradise. We had, we had a number of students or schools getting involved in F1 challenge. Okay, going through briefly, I've put in there some detail about challenge-based learning, which is a process developed by Apple, but it sets a slightly different starting point whereby students have to come up first with the actual problem to be solved. And that problem is based around a big idea. So it might be something like world poverty or um, 
uh, infectious diseases causing a lot of deaths or uh, everyone um, getting to class late might be a problem for younger kids. So you set a, a large problem and then they have to come up with a whole lot of processes through that, coming up with the essential questions involved with the problem um, and breaking that down into various challenges. But I'll leave that for you guys to read. There's a whole lot of resources there. And again, that can be done as a level three task, um, whereby you can come up with your own problem um, rather than the ones that I've set you in the year level um, level three tasks. Hi, so Jason. You, know, you know all those yeah, things where the challenges are. I've just got a white screens with like a exclamation mark. Is that what they're all supposed to have on there? Um, no. Like I'm actually on that design thinking page. And right down the end, you know, where it's, you know, you, well, you practically in the end, you've got the challenges, competitions, design yep. brief, competitions. Every single one of those things for me is just a white square with an exclamation mark in a grey circle. Oh, okay. Is there supposed I'll... to be things I watch? That. Um... In all the other parts, I've got, like, the videos and that, but just for some reason... No, I'm not seeing that. Um, sometimes that happens with fonts. If there's not a particular font installed on your computer um, and it tries to reinterpret the font and puts in strange characters. So you're just beyond design thinking, were you? Was it in challenge-based learning? Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, they're coming up all okay on mine. Um, okay, maybe I'll Later on, I'll, I'll go back in and I'll check to see if the fonts are any different for that section. Um, okay. That, but you could try refreshing your page and just seeing if it was a glitch in your browser just for the moment. Okay. So just in the last section, I want to talk about creativity. Um, so a lot of our design um, thinking processes and so forth are around trying to encourage creativity in our students. Now, creativity is developed across the curriculum. So it's not just in design and technology or the technologies learning area. We also encourage creativity in um, the arts in particular, but also in science and in many other areas, in English for creative writing and things of that nature. But some people think that creativity is something you're born with or is innate or worse still that you're not creative. Um, and some teachers sometimes tell me that they're not creative and so they have difficulty teaching creativity. But generally it's been found that there are ways of teaching creativity and encouraging creativity. And I've given you a whole range of strategies and processes and video clips that help explain those. Some are very complex, such as the Tritz one and so forth. But the five that I normally encourage with my students are linking, which is just associating various ideas together. So if you want to come up with a new um, device, say from the iPad, you might take the iPad and then you might take, um, uh, say, bicycles. And how you might combine bicycles and iPad to create a little um, uh, space on your on your bicycle so that you can have your GPS going and you can see where you're driving as you're riding your bicycle and combining those two. So that's the idea of linking. You take two ideas from sort of different areas and combine them to see if you can come up with other creative ways. And often that can be just done randomly. You just give kids random words or random ideas and there's various card games you can use that are available that have all those ideas and you can shuffle them and give them out and by combining things in different innovative ways you may prompt different creative thoughts. Then there's the black box idea, where you don't worry about the object itself, you just worry about what, what things would be coming into that and what things we'd want to have come out. So, say for a new computer game, we might want to be able to control it with our mind. And what comes out then is happening on the screen is things moving around just with our thoughts. So the inputs are just our mind, our thoughts, and the outputs are the characters in the game moving around and doing stuff. So without worrying about how that occurs, which is the black box, we can be creative in just thinking about what sort of things we want to go into the system and what things we want to come out. Then we have things such as um, parallels, which is looking at past solutions. So going back and looking at how other people have solved problems in the past and seeing how they might be applicable for us in our particular problem. There's variations. That's when you focus on one tiny little bit and you try to vary it. So, say again, if we're talking about iPads, focusing in just on maybe the on switch and how that could be changed, how that could be done differently. So, and looking at all the different ways we could turn it, turn it on differently to how it's currently designed to do. 
And then finally, there's the additive examples where we add things together. So we, um, again, we might take an iPad, we might add to that um, uh, the ability to be a, uh, what's something it can't do? <laughs> the ability for it to be a, a video recorder, which I know it can, but that would be an example of additive. And then you'd keep on adding more things on um, and making it more creative. So ability there's a number of videos there. So go on. I said the ability to be a video projector. Very good. I'm going to say that. See, it's <laughs> millionaire right here. <laughs> Absolutely. So ability to be a video projector, and then maybe you could think of some other things like, um, oh, yeah. We won't go into the creative process just now. No, don't. He'll um, steal your ideas. Gosh, <laughs> <laughs> Christy. <laughs> Just joking. Yeah, just sending off an email to a student having some difficulties. Um, so that then leads in this creativity, which is coming up with lots of great ideas, but then making those into a product is what we call innovation. So taking that creative thought processes and all those ideas and then turning it into something that's actually solving a problem in an innovative new way that's never been done before is what we call innovation. And I've given you a number of video clips there about turning bicycles into boats and washing machines and some fun ones about musical stairs and um, so forth. So getting your students to come up with that sort of innovation. So again, the problem might be littering in the school ground and coming up with an innovative new way of solving that problem through coming up with either a system or product that could address that um, and a whole range of other potential things. And that's what we use as design challenges and form the main component of design and technology education. So do we have any final comments or statements anyone would like to make, including those online? I'll just quickly check to see if there's no, anyone my statement, You know, like my statement, obviously, earlier was... Um, was oh, no, honestly, um, I haven't read this, but I've been going through all that you have done, and I know that if I'd have read this without this letter, I wouldn't have totally grasped all the concepts. So having... Um, you know, me reading through, I would advise everyone to be looking over the actual module while you're talking because it, it just made it a lot clearer for yeah, me. Yeah, me too. It does, and it's and that's the idea of these to help explain those points without going into too much lecturing mode. I did a fair bit of that this time, but I understand. Particularly, it helps this format when you haven't read the actual material in detail. Hmm. Okay. But well, it's the end, so I'm allowed to be silly now. It is. Hey ben, so any final comments from anyone? Hey Ben. <laughs> yeah, I saw it. I'm getting it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like... No, so that's thank you very it. much. Thank you. Thank you very much thank to Ben, you. Catherine, and Christy for your participation in the panel this week. And I would really encourage more of you to be involved. Of course, it makes it a much more dynamic and engaging in, um, space for us to learn together when there's plenty of people to throw ideas against and bounce them around and discuss them. Yeah. So for those watching during the week, remember you can keep posting your questions or comments into the discussion group. And for those online that have asked those questions, thank you for doing so and for participating. And hope to see you all here next week for our next lecture on computational thinking. Okay. Bye for now. Bye.